The mold has damaged everything. Oh, yeah. I'm having joint pains, back aches, because I sleep in my sofa. The GP said um, after he spoke to her, he diagnosed all three of us with PTSD. Like every night I have to be dropping an eye drop because um, of the mold. Imagine that at any point in your life, you could be given 48 hours to pack it up and move on. Last year, that was the case for a record number of families living in temporary accommodation. In some London boroughs, as many as one in 10 children don't have a permanent place to call home. While some are moved from hotel room to hotel room, many end up in former social housing, now owned by private landlords. And with six times as many newly homeless families as homes being built, councils are being pushed to financial ruin, finding temporary accommodation to fill the gap. Temporary accommodation is a stopgap in the hidden homelessness crisis, and councils are paying the price for a failed national housing policy. So, what's it like to be trapped in temporary accommodation now? And how did we get here? I spoke to Malisha. With her two children, she's been in temporary accommodation, including hostels, since 2016, when her private landlord decided he wanted his property back. She's been placed outside of Lewisham, her borough, and into a property that's overcrowded, riddled with mould, and infested with mice. So this is, so this is not... This is your okay. bedroom? Yeah. Since 2022, we may we moved in here. So the mold has damaged everything. Oh yeah, I'm so That's sorry. My, my daughter's car seat, because they took the car. Um, everything is damaged, even the, the suitcases and over there. Yeah, I can see it. So everything in here, we, you know. Is this better or worse than where you were before? This is... Um, in terms, in terms of the of mold. The mold. In terms it's of the worse. mold, it's worse. It's worse because in the previous property, it was in the built-in closets and on mostly on the window, but here, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in in the in the room where the kids are, on the bookshelf. It's just eating. Mm. So I don't I don't come in here unless I have to. The idea of your home is a place where. You, Ideally, you, you unpack, right? You put down roots. It's a place for you. And psychologically, I think that's a really important thing. And to have your life like this, in suitcases, in boxes, b before we even get onto the trauma of the actual conditions itself, it must be really, really hard. It is hard. I have never, ever envisioned or thought that something like this would happen to me I or anybody for that matter. We've been in the hostel, which was just one room, and I've, I've fixed it neatly just so the kids doesn't not notice the, the discomfort, but it's just impossible to do anything with this. Mm. You know, um, I'm having joint pains, back aches, because I sleep in my sofa. Mm. It's like one thing after another after another. Yeah. yeah. So then this is where your children sleep? Yeah. If you look, it started, I think, over there that everything, the bags and stuff that are there is all eaten. That's the bag for his guitar. I can see, yeah. It's all eaten. I didn't know books could, mold could eat books. Yeah. And and this is the situation for, for the kids. And so the mold comes like underneath here. That's how I have to just take it up, spray it, and um, leave it if we're going out. When we come back, then that's when I remake the bed so my children can sleep. They, every night I have to be dropping an eye drop because um, of the mold. When I got here, most of my stuff weren't able to fit. Oh, and, yeah, um, we, we can see, can't we? It's, yeah, even my really dining is. table was left. Where'd you eat? In the sofa, and that's where they work. If my son is working there, she has to go on her knees and she that's what she uses mm -hmm. to study. That's uh, where I sleep. You mentioned um, studying, right? Yeah. Both your children are studying here. Yes, in I your, homeschooled in, them. They were in school. They were in school, but um, because of the trauma that we have faced and, um, and the distance, um, my, son, my daughter, she was crying in school for headaches and I, I took her to the GP. So the GP said um, after he spoke to her, he diagnosed all three of us with PTSD. Mm. Um, and he said, if she doesn't want to go to school, do not force her. Mm. My son too, he was mentally um, affected you know, he was like behaving out of character, like just making little um, mischief in, in class. I mean, even if he was, right, staying in that school. Yeah. It's a long way from where we are right now. Yeah. I mean, how long would it take you to do the school run? Um, over an hour. Over an hour, because we have to, there was a time when the buses were on strike and it mm. took us three hours to get there. 
I used to just stay at the neighbors at the previous um, property. And then um, after we come back another three hours, one day we walked for an hour. Mm. You know, I didn't have money to take taxi and we walked until we saw a bus mm -hmm. trying to get here because it was in strike at the time. In an ideal world, best case scenario, what do you want? What do you need? I need a um, permanent settlement for my children and I. Sadly, situations like Malisha's aren't uncommon and the consequences can be fatal. 34 children had died while living in temporary accommodation. There is a direct correlation between being in temporary accommodation and unexpected child deaths. Those deaths were not expected. Those children didn't have cancer or other conditions. They were unexpected, untimely child deaths. That's how serious this is. I spoke to Vicky Spratt, housing correspondent at the iPaper, to find out how things got so bad. What has happened in London is sort of like a triple whammy of <laughs> clusterfucks, technical term. Um, so you have, like, we, we sold off loads of our social housing with this little policy called right to buy that was brought in by a prime minister, little disgust called Margaret Thatcher. If you've been a council tenant for at least three years, you'll have the right by law to buy your house and that's that. Probably the single greatest act of privatization this country's ever seen actually in terms of numbers. Um, very bad because social housing is an asset. If, if a council owns housing, it has homes that it can put people in, but it also gets rent. So the idea is is that in the end, that housing pays for itself or at least doesn't leave the council with a money problem. To be really explicit about it, these people used to live in uh, local authority owned social housing, right? And they would pay a rent that the local council, local authority would take in themselves. Instead of that being the case now, those same buildings, the literal same bricks and mortar sold off via right to buy, um, possibly a landlord, right? Buy to let mortgage or whatever. It, 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 the same property is now owned by a private landlord who rents it out, possibly to a, very, a family in very similar circumstances, but because they can't afford it, we now also subsidize those rents via housing benefit. It seems to me to be a slightly illogical policy process. I, I, might, I don't know, I might, is that a bit of a reach? I think that's probably an understatement. It's batshit crazy. We spend more on housing benefit than we spend on most government departments. And a lot of that housing benefit bill, yeah, goes, goes to private landlords. It's batshit crazy. Galaxy brain stuff. To refocus on temporary accommodation for a second, do we have an idea of how much councils are spending on temporary accommodation? Um, what's it costing them? I think the last bill, the last total bill, though I'm eagerly awaiting the next one, which is imminent, was around 17 billion a year in total. Highest it's ever been, 17 billion. That's a lot of money. It's not cost effective. It's bankrupting councils. Several councils have now said that it is the cost of temporary accommodation, which could drive them to financial ruin. Hastings is one of them. And it's a disaster. It makes absolutely no sense. It was completely avoidable. The writing's been on the wall for a really long time and the government has done nothing about it. And it's so bad. I get so cross about this. I'm sorry. It's just like... <laughs> you, no, you go off. Go day. off. I, mean, I never in a million years imagined it would be as bad as it is now that I would be shocked still by what I'm seeing and hearing and the situations people are being forced into. It is worse than I ever dared to imagine that it could be. It is worse than it could ever possibly have been. And it's devastating for people. It's devastating. And I just, I hope, I hope someone has a plan um, and they just don't want to tell me about it. I guess I just finally ask you sort of any a message, if you have one, for um, Lewisham Council, what it is that you need or would like to happen? You know, I, I would say to them, if they accept a duty of care to provide families with homes, they should stick to their words and mm. stop destroying people's life, because this is damaging to me and my children. 34 preventable deaths of homeless children. 17 billion pounds spent by councils on temporary accommodation. Countless lives held in suspension by an unsustainable market. And the solution, well, it's simple. Build more social housing. 
build more private housing because the stakes are simply too high if we don't.